Good morning, and thank you for attending the U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedoms hearing today on strategies for religious freedom in fragile states. I'd also like to thank our distinguished witnesses for joining us. The U.S. Commission on International Religious Freedom, or USERF, is an independent bipartisan U.S. government body created by the 1998 International Religious Freedom Act, or IRFA. The commission uses international standards to monitor freedom of religion or belief abroad and makes policy recommendations to the U.S. government. Today, USERF is exercising its statutory authority under IRFA to convene this virtual hearing. USERF works to monitor and protect religious freedom in a diverse array of countries and contexts. This diversity calls for a variety of tools and approaches as different contexts present different landscapes for the success and failure of religious freedom efforts. For today's hearing, we will be focusing on strategies for promoting religious freedom in fragile states. A fragile state is a country characterized by weak state capacity or weak state legitimacy, leaving citizens vulnerable to a range of shocks. From our vantage point, protection of freedom of religion or belief is under constant threat in fragile states. Often, governments in fragile states are incapable of holding perpetrators of religious freedom violations accountable because they lack the capacity and the territorial to control to enforce legal and social protections for religious freedom. In some instances, fragile governments may be complicit in these violations as they ally with or tolerate nefarious actors to strengthen or expand their tenuous control and legitimacy. For example, in Syria, Armed actors have laid siege to towns and villages with sizable religious minority populations, defacing and destroying Yazidi and Christian shrines, and detained, prosecuted, even tortured Yazidis, Christians, and other religious minority communities for their religious beliefs. In Afghanistan, political instability has exacerbated the risk of violence for those who hold minority or alternate religious beliefs from the Taliban. Furthermore, with security now in the hands of the Taliban's assigned, quote, special forces, and the reestablishment of the Ministry of the Promotion of Virtue and the Prevention of Vice policing the streets. Communities that hold opposing beliefs fear reprisal. In Houthi-controlled areas of Yemen, Jews and Baha'is continue to be harassed and arrested for their beliefs amidst a six-year armed conflict. In the face of stateness, state weakness in Lebanon, the government empowers religious elites with a monopoly on spiritual matters that can restrict alternate religious beliefs and exacerbate sectarian violence. In Somalia, parishioners risk suicide bombs and targeted attacks against houses of worship as the fledging government struggles to wrest control of key parts of the country from the violent terrorist group Al-Shabaab. These are just some of the many examples we see of the overlap between fragility and religious violence. I will now turn it over to Vice Chair Turkel to discuss U.S. government efforts to date and some of the challenges that our government faces in responding to religious freedom violations in fragile states. Thank you very much, Chair Mianza. I'd like to join in welcoming you all to today's hearing. As Chair Mianza has highlighted, many living in fragile states face significant barriers to worshiping safely and accessing their religious right to freedom of uh, right to, rights to freedom of religion or belief. In recent years, policy and lawmakers have increasingly recognized the threat that fragility and stability around the world pose to U.S. values and interests. In the 2018 Stabilization Assistance Review, then Secretaries of State and Defense the administrators for the U.S. Agency for International Revol Development highlighted that persistent and protected conflicts and instability, they create directly affect the security interests of the United States and our allies. With the introduction of the 2019 Glo Global Fragility Act, Congress has identified that the violence and violent conflict underpin in many of the United States government's key national security challenges. The consensus is clear. Fragility and violent conflict undermines U.S. interests abroad and at home. Although many fragile countries have poor religious freedom conditions, in addition to Syria, Afghanistan, Yemen, Lebanon, and Somalia, as mentioned by Chair Mianza, we can see the overlap in Central African Republic, the Sahel, Mozambique, Nigeria, and Burma. The list goes on. While the link between fragility and violations of right to freedom of religion or belief are clear, the avenues for successful policy interventions are often less so. In these difficult and complex contexts, policy tools like the sanctions, raising awareness, and diplomacy often prove ineffective in addressing or cha uh, changing conditions for vulnerable communities on the ground. 
pro providing programmatic funding and capacity building support yields limited protection as insecurity limits how far these efforts can reach outside the capital. In fact, in some cases, sanctions or other punitive policies may weaken a, an already fragile government, exasperating insecurity while delivering future non-results to vulnerable population facing religious restrictions. This is why it is so important that we think creatively and innovatively about how to construct and implement strategies that will improve religious freedom condition in these fragile states and help cement religious freedom norms and protections as an important part of broader civilization efforts. We look forward to hearing the testimonies of our witnesses on these issues, along with the recommendations the United States government can implement to better protect and pr promote religious freedom in fragile states. Now I will turn the floor back to Chair Mianza to introduce our witnesses. Thank you. Thank you so much, Vice Chair Turkel. First, we will have Dr. Ellie El Hindi, the Executive Director of Aiden Foundation, a Lebanon based Foundation for Diversity, Solidarity, and Human Dignity. He's also an Associate Professor at Notre Dame University in Lebanon. Um, Corinne Graff is a Senior Advisor at the US Institute of Peace, where her work focuses on long term strategies and policies to prevent the outbreak or escalation of conflict in fragile states. James Patton is a CEO and President of the International Center for Religion religions and diplomacy, where he serves as a member of a number of collaborative efforts to combat, to advance, sorry, the field of peacemaking. And then Ibrahim Musa, PhD, is a Mirza family professor of Islamic thought and Muslim societies at Notre Dame's Co-School of Global Affairs and Department of History. You can read their entire bios um, on our website. We're also going to share that link um, with those of you joining us via Zoom. So first, we'll start with you, Dr. Hindi. Thank you, Honorable Madam Chair, dear members of the commission. It's a great pleasure to be with you uh, this evening, this morning in the US, I assume. Let me start by saying that I am speaking to you from a fragile Lebanon, unfortunately, where basic livelihood needs are no longer guaranteed. And thus, what I will share with you is based as much on intellectual or scholarship work as it is on real life experience and my work in Lebanese and Arab civil society for the past 20 years. And I ask you to bear with me in case there will be some cuts in my internet stream or in electricity. The challenge of uh, form and conflicts based on identity are actually increasing rather than decreasing with time. To understand this, we need to start by reflecting on why are humans becoming more aggressive, more attached to their identity, less willing to compromise, less willing to find common grounds and to accept the other. Religions of the world have been a major part of this, or to be clearer, it is how we deal with religions that is the problem. Events of the past two decades prove that the world have dismissed religion and identity politics probably too early. We thought that extreme and sometimes even forced secularism would be the best antidote of religious extremism. We thought that globalization is the best way to unite people around the world. In fact, a Western style secularism that is aggressively excluding or at least neglecting religions and other identities seems to me doomed to implode and cause reactions. A globalized world does not solve identity caused conflicts. On the contrary, it makes these conflicts and the fragile states resulting from them an international concern that needs to be addressed collectively. Thus, I applaud the efforts of your committee to advise global strategy, global US strategy, and encourage the US to lead global efforts to uphold for the way only it can. And I present to you the following observations. Number one, promoting inclusive citizenship. The promotion of one size fit all style of secular democracy has to be dropped in favor of the promotion of complex and unique democratic systems that are adapted to the reality of each country. Equal citizenship, equality before the law, and equal dignity and rights of all, uh, of all human beings are definitely and must continue to be the essence and the basis of every potential solution. Yet, maybe these are not sufficient. Any solution that aims at successfully bringing sustainable peace and proper state building needs to take into consideration 
and maybe even be based to a certain extent on the respect of religious and other identities and on transforming these from a reason of conflict to a partner, a tool for the solution. People's attachment to their faith and religious identities must not be neglected or put down because if it is, it has a high probability of radicalizing and turning into extremism. And as we have seen, every extremism encourages the rise of counter extremism, leading to the vicious cycle of feeding on the existence and strength of each other, feeding on xenophobia, on victimization. Inclusive citizenship is the best way to address the issue of religious identities within the norms of democracy and strong statehood. Number two, promoting alternative religious narratives. Violations of four requires an aggressive religious discourse that dehumanizes the other, promotes hate speech and discrimination, and thus prepares the ground to legitimize violence against people. While we have witnessed in the past years huge efforts and steps forward in presenting alternative religious discourse and interpretations that promote tolerance, acceptance of the other, and the role of interfaith dialogue in promoting mutual acceptance and respect. Yet we are far from reaching a time when these moderate alternative religious discourses are mainstream. We must promote the existing narratives, encourage the new ones, connect moderate religious leaders together, introduce alternative narratives in religious schools and protect, support champions of this frontier battle from a uh, battlefront from all religious backgrounds. A US strategy must empower and build on the faith-based activism that strives for peace, mutual respect and inclusive citizenship. Promoting number three, promoting religious social responsibility. Serious efforts must be invested in rehumanizing religion and promoting the social responsibility of religions, religious institutions and religious leaders. Worshiping God in almost all religions goes hand in hand with the good relation with his children. In addition to the theological dialogue that are increasingly happening, a more urgent dialogue is needed. A dialogue, an interfaith dialogue for life and for reconciliation. A dialogue that happens in refugee camps, in the poor suburbs of cities, behind the scenes of battlefronts and on peace negotiation tables in soup kitchens feeding the poor, in efforts of religious leaders from different religions working together to address the social, economic, and ethical challenges of their communities. A US strategy must support the efforts to rehumanize religion, to promote interfaith initiatives, and to support faith-based actors for peace and reconciliation. Fourth and finally, promoting state building, most importantly and beyond all of the above, a U.S. strategy for four must continue to have an ultimate aim of preventing fragile states from falling into and becoming failed states. The first victims of the failure of the state are moderate voices and peace builders. Thus, proper state building balances, balances between rule of law and equal citizenry on one hand and the respect of the different religious traditions and values on the other. This should be our ultimate goal. Thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Hindi. Now we will move um, to Corinne Graf. Thank you. Thank you, Chair Mayenza and Vice Chair Turkel and the other members of this commission for the opportunity to speak at this important and timely hearing today. As armed conflicts in fragile states have increased in number, duration, and intensity since the 1990s, and we've seen the spillovers from conflict zones rise exponentially, particularly the spread of violent extremism and rise of the Islamic State, as well as one of the largest displacement crises in human history. 1% of the world's entire population or one in 97 people have been forcibly displaced from their homes. According to the UN, 250 million people lack any access to justice whatsoever because they've either been forcibly displaced or they live in ungoverned spaces in conflict zones. Conflict-related humanitarian emergencies have multiplied stretching the capacity of the multilateral system to deliver emergency relief. The global hunger crisis is growing. And while this is certainly being exacerbated by the economic impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic, in the first instance, it's being fueled by persistent conflicts that have simmered in countries around the world for years or even decades in the Horn of Africa, the Sahel, the Middle East and Central Asia. 
And we know that the impacts of global climate change will only exacerbate these trends. It's in response to these trends that the international community has coalesced in recent years around the need for new approaches to reduce conflicts underlying drivers and fragile states. Fragile states are defined as countries where state society relations and the social compact between citizens and their government are frayed and where governments substantially lack legitimacy and citizen trust in public institutions is very limited or non-existent. The rationale for improving peace building and stabilization policy in these places is clear. In addition to reducing human suffering, the UN estimates that the international community stands to save $20 in costly military and humanitarian crisis response for every $1 invested in conflict prevention. This new consensus on fragile states is reflected in policy documents ranging from the UN World Bank Pathways for Peace report to the UK's elite bargains and political deals research, and here in the United States, the Global Fragility Act. There are differences across these frameworks to be sure, but they all share a number of common strategies and policy instruments that have withstood the test of time and proved effective over the past two decades. Several of these intersect squarely with the promotion of religious freedom agenda. It's important to note that the relationship between freedom of religion and fragility and conflict is complex. My colleagues in USIP's Religion and Inclusive Societies program have argued that religious discrimination and other forms of state repression can lead communities to take up arms, although that's less likely to happen in situations of extremely high state repression, for example, Saudi Arabia and Iran. Uh, the converse is also true since conflict can lead to religious discrimination and greater regulation. We've seen this, of course, in Myanmar, where violence between Buddhist and Rohingya communities has resulted in an uptick in discrimination there. Ultimately, it'll be very important to conduct more analysis so we have a better understanding of freedom of religion's impacts on peace and vice versa. The impacts of the COVID-19 pandemic on this landscape are still coming into view. The virus continues to spread unabated in many developing countries, and so we don't yet know the full extent of its impacts. Yet we do know that the pandemic is further fraying the social contract and deepening fragility in countries around the world. We're seeing rising numbers of anti-government protests, and we see very low trust in public institutions and public opinion polls. It will therefore be crucial that the global recovery efforts um, in the wake of COVID integrate conflict prevention and the promotion of democracy and human rights into the global pandemic response. The substantial amount of assistance that's being delivered to address COVID-19's impacts must heed the lessons we've learned about engaging effectively in fragile states. So in the time I had left, I'd like to turn to several strategies we've learned about engaging effectively in these contexts. First is to recognize that all development programs in these settings have a deeply political dimension. Addressing the root causes of conflict and violence is an inherently political enterprise, uh, a lesson reflected across many of the reports of the Special Inspector General for Afghanistan Reconstruction. Diplomatic and development activities in conflict-affected states should therefore be viewed not only as tools for policymakers to communicate with country representatives or to promote economic development. A central goal must be to encourage and support local peace builders and political reformers inside and outside government in these countries. To promote more politically aware approaches, we need professional incentives and rewards for US Foreign Service officers who support and incentivize national and local reforms. Second, inclusive approaches are critical in fractured societies where state relations are weak. Representatives from local governments, uh, civil society, grassroots organizations, including faith-based leaders and communities, as well as women and youth should be involved as much as possible in strategy formulation and implementation phases of policy and programs. Failing to do so can reinforce the very conflict dynamics that the US uh, is seeking to address, creating a perception that only elite actors are being engaged and that they're accountable to external rather than domestic constituencies. Third, fostering local leadership at the national and local level and supporting the reform agendas of local leaders is key. Over two decades of international engagement in fragile states demonstrates a hard-earned lesson. Externally imposed solutions and timelines uh, don't lead to sustainable progress. External actors are most likely to be successful when they support the efforts of national and local leaders. The more ownership and agency for this leader, these leaders, the more contextual and sustainable the solutions. To facilitate international support for country-led solutions um, include uh, tools, include country-led assessments 
of the risks of violence and conflict, inclusively developed plans that form the basis for partnership between the United States and international and local actors and compact based agreements between donors and fragile states themselves that set out the terms of the partnership. Fourth, the management of development programs must be adaptive. Adaptive program management involves gathering regular information about whether policy interventions are achieving their goals and adapting them as needed to better fit the changing context. USAID and other agencies must establish relationships, feedback mechanisms, and trust with the local and national stakeholders most affected by the program. Congress also has an important role to play in incentivizing more adaptive approaches in fragile states, for example, by requiring that agencies outline their annual strategic learning processes in these countries rather than their programmatic plans. And fifth, there must be better alignment between development, humanitarian, and peacebuilding programming in these countries. This principle is particularly relevant in complex emergencies where peace processes may be underway in the context of humanitarian emergencies. Policy innovations that can help build bridges across these sectors include undertaking joint assessments of fragility and structural drivers of conflict, mainstreaming do no harm principles across humanitarian and development programs, and establishing donor coordination structures that regularly bring together international development agencies uh, and our partners in fragile states on the ground. Finally, let me just say that the Global Fragility Act offers an important opportunity to improve the effectiveness of stabilization and peace building. The State Department, USAID, the Department of Defense and other agencies have released a robust US government strategy as required under the law. It's significant because in the past we've seen humanitarian development and security assistance too often work at cross purposes. Um, delivered in the absence of overarching policy frameworks. Uh, in addition to releasing a new strategy, no decision will be more consequential to the new approach's success than the identification of focus countries and regions where the US will test this new approach. This process of selecting countries has been underway for nearly a year and is now significantly delayed. It will be critical to ensure the countries selected provide us with a window of opportunity to partner with reformers, the US government, um, should exclude from consideration states where the prospects for such partnerships are extremely limited, including countries on the use of countries of particular concern or special watch list. Let me stop there uh, and again thank the chair and vice chair and commissioners for holding this hearing and would be pleased to answer any questions in the Q&A. Great, thank you so much. Um, and now James Patton, we will go to you. Thank you. Wonderful, thank you very much. I'd like to thank uh, you, sir, particularly uh, you, Chair Manza, Vice Chair Turkel, other commissioners, colleagues of the commission, and the guests that have joined us. Uh, I'm grateful to join my illustrious fellow panelists in this hearing, and I've submitted longer written remarks that I encourage people, if they're interested, to read, but just want to highlight a few points from those. Uh, the explicit acknowledgement in, in USG stabilization strategies of the need for community-driven practices, I think, points directly to a growing recognition in recent years of the importance of religious actors with respect to conflict and stability operations. There is some debate, however, about a direct causal link between restrictions on freedom of religion and belief, which I will shorthand as for going forward, and social instability. The Stimson Center asserted in 2021 that more research is needed to determine whether and how forward restrictions correlate with the outbreak of violent conflict worldwide. But I would suggest some anecdotal and intuitive reasons that restrictions on forward are a significant contributor to conditions for possible conflict. One, there is a tendency towards identity conflict in contexts of group inequality. Two, social and political exclusion is commonly cited as a grievance that drives conflict and radicalization. Three, most traditions, religious traditions, are grounded in some assertion that they hold a form of absolute truth, which by definition is exclusive of other truths. And four, the transcendent nature of faith exponentially amplifies internal justifications for intergroup prejudices by giving them divine sanction. Therefore, if social and governance structures support restrictions on form, pitting protected religious groups against excluded ones, they contribute directly to a powerful driver of identity conflict. Now, 
While religious identity groups themselves can be the most serious perpetrators of religious intolerance, religion's role as a driver of intolerance and instability can be especially grievous when it aligns with political interests that are served by targeting religious outgroups. Political restrictions on Forb are rampant globally. The Stimson Center report from 2021 states that state attempts to eliminate the presence of at least one religious group from the country have been recorded in Afghanistan, Algeria, Azerbaijan, Bahrain, China, Comoros, Egypt, Eritrea, Indonesia, Iran, Iraq, Malaysia, Myanmar, Pakistan, and on and on, you get the picture. It is critical that the United States pressures its allies to prioritize for protections in domestic and international policies. We must collaborate to commit in action and not just in rhetoric to promote pluralist societies with legal, social, and educational policies that protect minority religious rights. Allies must refrain from agitating conflict between religious identity groups in order to increase regional and geopolitical influence. We have seen firsthand evidence of the ripple effect of religious oppression beyond borders. Religious persecution in one place will amplify prejudice, punitive legislation, vengeance violence, and the like in other contexts, resulting in a self-reinforcing cycle. One program being conducted by the International Center for Religion and Diplomacy has shown how unrest and persecution in Myanmar's Rakhine state, Sri Lanka's Easter bombings in 2019, and recent developments in Afghanistan are tied directly to documented increases in religious-based intolerance, discrimination against minorities, and indigenous peoples, intercommunal violence, and the securitization of FORB under the rubric of fighting terrorism in other contexts. Now, FORB has been a popular theme in recent years, often employed by religious groups and allies to protect their own adherents. But one critical aspect of FORB is that it cannot be selective. Protections must be universal for it to be meaningful. Not only is this an issue of equal rights, it's a practical issue. Uh, where the state is weak or absent, universalizing a commitment by faith communities to form may actually be itself a simple way to reduce identity conflicts because while faith tenets portray other traditions as representing perhaps an incorrect understanding of divine truth, if they find common cause in efforts to elevate form protections, and they understand these protections as mutually reinforcing, this common cause can develop understanding and empathy, which are key elements in programs that are successful in reducing identity conflict. So interreligious cooperation in promoting a narrative that the United States should continue to advance, that broad protections of belief and worship protect all religious faithful is very key. This is very salient. Uh, when it comes to beliefs that we don't understand or share. In some cases, those beliefs may not easily integrate into a Western liberal dem democratic framework, but Forbes should still be rigorously applied without prejudice. One example of a program done by us at ICRD is that we've engaged with nonviolent conservative self-described Salafi communities in Tunisia, which had seen a significant number of recruits sent to foreign terrorist organizations. And whereas more moderate voices might not reach or persuade members of their communities, conservative imams had a kind of influence and access to at-risk community members to reorient them away from violent extremism. Now, the teachings within those communities might not have been fully aligned with values embraced by the United States uh, in, in government or civil society, including questions of gender equality, for example, but the commitment to religiously based admonitions to reject violent extremism was shared. Importantly, one of the primary grievances found among the community related to a broad sense of exclusion and prejudice against the Salafi community by civil society, the media, and the government. This sense of isolation was expressed as a direct driver of radicalization within the community. The potential Tension, however, between liberal democratic values raises a very important question that I think we in the Forb community must grapple with. Religion and belief do not expire at the walls of a house of worship. Personal faith, sacred doctrine, and religious teachings all compel religious adherents to act in society, and there are times in which the behaviors that religious faithful engage in come into direct conflict with civil law frameworks and norms. 
And I'm not just talking about external religious practice here. I'm also talking about domestic identity groups. Simply put, four protections cannot include four justified intergroup prejudice that manifests as structural or physical violence. Tensions arise between civil and religious law when the latter is understood by faith adherence to supersede the former as derived from a divine source believed to hold authority above that of the state. We have heard four arguments used by governments and religious identity groups to justify restricting the freedoms and rights of others. Protection of Forb must have boundaries where a faith community is engaged in or inciting a violation of the rights of others or a religious exemption represents a violation of equal protection or the responsibility to the common good. So I would just encourage that a clear articulation of the boundaries of religious freedom, not in worship or belief, but in intergroup behaviors in a pluralist society would likely have the end result of protecting the myriad faith adherents around the world. So thank you for your time. Thank you so much. And lastly, but not least, we go to Dr. Ibrahim Musa. Thank you so much, uh, Chepas and Manza, and thank you to the commissioners at this hearing for your time. I appreciate uh, the opportunity to speak on religious freedom to this uh, distinguished panel of you, serve. So religious freedom uh, is not a concept uniformly accepted around the world. I think we, most of us, hopefully can keep that in mind, and most of us are familiar with that. In many fragile states, and regions, say for instance, that I know best with Muslim majorities or minorities, for example, the concept of freedom is contested and varied. And in certain circumstances, it is subordinate to religious claims. What is needed in our view, my view, based on my work, is that we need deep knowledge of local ecologies is necessary for US government actors to effectively support minority religious groups as dignity and inclusion, and to do so in the most enduring way. And that is by empowering endogenous pro-pluralism modes of thinking and practice. The Madrasa Discourses program that began five years under my leadership at University of Notre Dame seeks to revitalize Islamic theological education in different settings in South Asia with recent graduates of, mad of madrasas, both men and women. Our experiences offer insightful lessons as to how long-term engagement focused on supporting local efforts rooted in tradition can lay the groundwork for tolerance and to further embed values of coexistence into local communities. Our approach was elicited, in other words, beginning from values in which communities find common and shared interests. A major difference is our realization that there are more pervasive processes of social integration outside the state and elections. Social recognition refers to the social psychological ethical and political practices through which actors evaluate, acknowledge, and engage with their fellows in society. So we, based on our experience, propose that in matters of religious freedom, that we take seriously social recognition, as well as an illicit approach as some of the most effective ways of gaining trust and advancing the best interests of multiple communities. In diametric opposition to say, lightning interventions that cherry pick scripture verses to educate religious leaders on the values of tolerance, pluralism and countering violence, Madrasa discourses instead educates future and current Madrasa educators with an ecological approach. What does that mean? By investing in the rich resources of the Muslim tradition and empowering them to deploy these values in their communities. These efforts do multiple things. 
they first of all equip religious leaders to construct narratives for themselves, not from outside, that uplift human dignity and allow participants to constructively respond to modern concerns. Emerging from the stated needs of scholars in the Indian and Pakistani ulama communities and relying on authentic traditional knowledge, the program graduated participants who are comfortable with diversity and now view the world as a complex place, as a complex place, not in black and white terms. When you make people comfortable with understanding diverse knowledge frames, they are amenable to diversity and complexity. There are of course porous boundaries and complex interplays between what we mark as religion and a range of fields of practice such as knowledge acquisition, the role of tradition, questions of belonging, identity and governance. While these are indexed as distinctions, they resist strict separation and dichotomies. So I would say that, you know, people do take their identity seriously. Identity is not necessarily the enemy. Religious freedom is not a goal to be achieved, but is part of an upshot of social and moral goods that flourishing societies generate. It requires the broader public and social goods to be met as a precondition Otherwise, religious freedom often becomes an instrument to reach political ends without overall social and moral accomplishments. There's an interesting story of participants in our cohort of over 150 people over five years who have two years of intensive education under our watch. Some of them, for instance, have never met or talked to persons belonging to a rival denomination, such as a Diobandi never talked to a Barelvi or a Sunni never meeting a Shia or talking to them, leave alone talking to a faculty member who is Jewish or Christian of a Christian background. We have a story, for instance, of one person whose father was killed in violence between Sunni and Shias. And this person took a vow that he would always hate Shias after coming into our program, talking to people with different uh, you know, uh, uh, approaches to life and different backgrounds, he changed his views. And he's now the biggest advocate for toleration. The Madrasa Discourses program makes no explicit reference to buzzwords such as religious freedom, countering violent extremism, or defending religious minorities. These themes and topics emerge organically out of structured conversations on broader investigations and mutual study on theology, history, and questions of justice. Yet Madrasa Discourses graduated religious leaders who are now issuing religious rulings, fatwas, and teaching future Islamic study students whose renewed knowledge of tradition shifted their worldviews. Across fragile contexts, religious actors are already leading the kind of intra-traditional work that can lead to lasting positive changes in how communities perceive the other. US policy actors and NGO partners can sensitively support and expand, expand such programs which can also pair seamlessly with interfaith exchange opportunities. Religion is an ambivalent force when it comes to peace and conflict. Some institutional capacity already exists within the US government to map the role of religion and religious groups in situations of fragility, such as the religious landscape mapping in conflict affected states initiative at the US Institute of Peace or the interagency conflict assessment framework developed by the State Department yet much more deep and nuanced understanding of fragile context and their religious dynamics is needed. Afghanistan is a glaring example where the US avoided a cross-section of actors and only focused on urban elites mostly. Universities, NGOs, and diaspora communities can help build this capacity provided they can identify with a range of local actors and not selected ones. In territories where the state is weak, or captured by extremist or exclusive ideologies, such as narco states, or those where government services are offered to communities based on patronage and identity, faith-based actors often fill the gap. The US government can work through these faith-based actors to provide critical services from humanitarian aid to education, but must do so in a conflict-sensitive way 
that clearly maps and interventions impact on the religious power dynamics in an area. A successful program could equitably serve residents and displaced persons, for example, and integrate practices that undergird tolerance between groups such as social cohesion. An intervention that doesn't pay attention to power dynamics, meanwhile, can end up supporting only one religious identity group and deepening patterns of animosity that exacerbate intolerance. So I'll include my concluding recommendations are, one, deepen US policy actors as cultural and religious literacies. And I've heard this from my fellow colleagues, so I'm happy about that, that there's a broader understanding, there's a broader kind of consensus about this. To deepen US policy actors as cultural and religious literacies by reaching out to non-typical actors outside the literacy of liberal Western frameworks of aid and NGO intervention. For instance, intensive and meaningful exchanges with the ulama or priests and religious leaders in addition to other sectors is a valuable component, but it's not a one-off meeting or a visit to the US. It requires deep and long enduring work. Second point, ensure conflict sensitive work with faith-based organizations in fragile contexts. Thirdly, empower endogenous intra and interreligious efforts that lay the building blocks for enduring plural social recognition. Local and contextual understandings of religious freedoms are varied. And furthermore, the notions of minority and majority religious, complex, uh, religious groups is a complex one. Just look at Syria, where the minority Alawites control the government, or the long, decades long Sunni control of Iraq under Saddam Hussein. A nuanced and conflict sensitive approach that partners with long term stakeholders, with stakeholder led efforts to build pluralism is, in my view, the path forward. Thank you for your time. Thank you so much. I know we, we are asking the toughest of questions, which is in the most difficult parts of the world with the least amount of legitimacy in government. How do we you know, protect and promote religious freedom and how do we advise the US government to do that better? I mean, these are really the toughest of, of all questions. So you, you've all addressed them and just uh, such an expert way with, and you all bring such diverse um, and, and really in-depth experience that we really appreciate you spending time with us this morning. And I, I think we probably all have so many questions, but I, I think for us is, um, you know, you'd mentioned, I know um, Dr. Musa is Af Afghanistan is a good example of the elites were in, engaged, but not a, a lot of a broader section of, um, of society and, and you see places like in Afghanistan where there didn't seem to be legitimacy with the government, but then you have a place like Northeast Syria where there's legitimacy with the government and there's some protection of human rights and there's just inconsistency with how the US can deal with that. How can we as you sort of better um, recommend for the US government in these areas to be able to, to allow some indigenous, um, the, the people of each community to play a bigger role in finding a way forward, because all of you were consistent of talking about how important those local voices, those local narratives, the, the cultural and nuances that we can't just walk into a country and, and understand and bring those people in. It's very complex, every country is different, but I'd love to understand how you think we could better recommend a way forward in these fragile states, in these kind of situations. Nadine, thank you. Uh, I'll give it a shot. I, I don't think I have all the answers, but what is the other, country that you mentioned after Afghanistan? I, I just mentioned Northeast Syria as a contrast to the place oh, that North has a, 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 okay. It's, it's I, kind of a unique like place, but obviously still it. a, a, a difficult country. Look, what my experience is that, you know, we only talk to people who, are, who can speak a little bit of English or English speaking, understand our patterns. And I think we need to be brave. And I think what you serve might want to do is to say, we need to work with non-typical non -typical actors. That's the key thing. Um, you know, rural people, you know, uh, women who have a different understanding of who they think of themselves and how they think the world works. Um, we need to talk to religious groups that are not only religious groups that say to us what we want to hear, but also what we don't want to hear. So I think once we make our input complex and deeper and on the, on the lines that we are challenged, we will come out, we will come up with better uh, recommendations and, 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 possibilities of working together, but not necessarily always on our agenda. So our experience has been, let the process grow organically rather than being prescriptive. Mm -hmm. 
And I think prescription, so you have the idea of religious freedom, but you know, religious freedom is not going to be, because people are suspicious. What do you mean by religious freedom? You want the Ahmadis in Pakistan to flourish, okay? Or you want, you know, the Shias or the Sunnis to flourish in this context. So that's the first thought. One has to first build trust and make them understand that what are your cultural values and then help them in a certain kind of way of understanding the nuances of their cultural and religious values. And here the United States, I always say to people, when it comes to the world of Islam, the United States has some of the best resources, libraries, expertise. But the one place this complex knowledge of religion and Islam doesn't get into is into government. Uh, we go to war on the say-so of one or two experts, not a complex input. So I would say that we need to make this more complex and we need to make use of the resources we have and the multiple voices we have on this continent. Thank you so much. And if we're done with that one, we can go to um, Vice Chair Turkel and let you ask a question. Thank you. Thank you. I have a question for uh, Ms. Graft. Um, you describe how poor religious freedom conditions intersect with fragility. Could you explain more about the relationship between strong respect for religious freedom and stability? And how does religious freedom contribute to stability? And the, uh, the additional question follows that is, how does stability contribute to religious freedom? Yes, thank you, Vice Chair. Um, I mean, as I said, I, I do think that more research is needed on that question. Um, and I think there's agreement in the community that we need to do more research on this. Um, I didn't speak about this. I think some of my, my fellow panelists did, but um, religious leaders, uh, religious uh, leader-led dialogues, of course, play a key role in uh, conflict resolution. So uh, I know I, I didn't touch on this and, and I should have, um, but clearly um, having access to religious leaders um, who are empowered um, in their countries uh, and who of course, for any variety of reasons um, can understand the local context and have of course, very strong influence in their countries and in their communities. Um, working with those actors is key to uh, conflict resolution. There's no question. Um, and I think your second question was about the, the reverse side of that equation and, um, and when what the intersection between discrimination and conflict is. Um, and I think, I think there, and, and I'm not an expert on uh, religious freedom the way some of my, my fellow panelists are, but um, the key issue for me is the, the, the fact that fragility is at the core of these conflicts. And what we understand by fragility is a, a deeply political concept um, that has to do with um, the respect of fundamental rights, being responsive to citizens. Um, and I think that religious freedom is one aspect of what we wanna see in, in resilient states that are more open and responsive. Um, and so I, I would think that, you know, discriminate, religious discrimination um, and regulation of, of relig religion is probably a sign of, of fragility um, and contexts that are likely to be uh, more unstable and prone to violence. Um, so, but I, I welcome thoughts from my other panelists who focused on this from, from probably other perspectives. <laughs> thank you, thank you. As we have seen, uh, there are a number of countries always use uh, achieving stability as a as an excuse for religious persecution. Thank you. Great. Um, thank you. I'd love to open it to our my other um, fellow commissioners to ask questions. And um, so this is Commissioner Carr. Thank you, Madam Chair. First of all, thanks to our commentators for a the excellence of their presentation. I have a question for Professor Alhindi. <coughs> Excuse me. In your view, is religious tolerance always compatible with religious freedom? In some instances, wouldn't freedom of religion mean the freedom to hold views appearing to be intolerant? Of course, I'm assuming the holder does not inflict or incite violence. How can we square the circle and promote religious tolerance while at the same time protecting freedom of belief. 
Thank you, Commissioner. Very, very important question. Um, I think that, uh, uh, first of all, I, I intentionally try to the, the term tolerance um, in our connotation or the way we use it, at least in, in, uh, in the Arab context, let me say, tolerance is, is a kind of, uh, um, it's given some kind of a condescending approach, meaning that I have the truth and thus I will allow you to exist within my norms or within my control. So in that sense, we push more towards mutual respect, towards mutual understanding, towards peaceful coexistence and living together in that sense, just as a, as a term of using the terms in that in general context. Um, now, definitely we do have uh, religious interpretations that do contradict with human rights, basic human rights, or with the concept of um, accepting the other and respecting the other. Uh, thus, uh, that's why I insisted in, in my uh, intervention to give it the two level approach. We must definitely work on advancing alternative interpretations and alternative discourse with the leaders of religions and with the scholars and with theologians of each of the religions. And thus this approach must not be neglected. It must be pushed forward. And we have seen very significant uh, steps, whether with the visit of the Pope to, to, uh, to uh, Dubai, the context with uh, Al-Azhar, the visit to Sistani in, in, uh, in Iraq and in other uh, very significant contributions. This is, this is the top down, but it also must be complemented with the bottom uh, level, with the grassroots, with the common living together on common issues and common values. And here we speak about um, values or public life values, uh, the things that we simply can uh, share, even if we have completely different theological or religious perspectives. So I can still strongly and deeply believe that in my belief, you are a um, kafir or you are a heretic. Yet you are a citizen, an equal citizen of the same state. What can we do together? How can we live together in that sense? On the very basis of, you know, we have a common interest of doing business together. We have a common and so on. So this is the grassroots level that must connect and, and, uh, um, and complement the bottom uh, down perspective. And these two consequently will make us avoid this existing yet I hope diminishing gap uh, uh, with between tolerance and between four as you presented it. Uh, let's be also conscious uh, about what uh, what uh, Commissioner Turkel mentioned or asked uh, that most of the times definitely uh, religion is not the reason of the conflict. It is simply the fuel. It is simply the tool to promote conflict and to uh, use and mobilize people based on their fear, based on their grievances, to make them fuel for this, uh, for this conflict. So we must address and deal with these grievances as a start, as an open way to make people be able to talk to each other on a human level beyond the uh, um, religious or theological differences. Thank you. Wonderful. Thank you so much. I know Commissioner Bagava, you have a question? Thank you, Chairman Manza, and, and thank you everyone for, for the extraordinary remarks and, and reflections. Um, there's a couple of through lines that I just wanted to pick up on um, from, from all of your remarks. I mean, one, one is really uh, the, the importance of, of reaching out to uh, grassroots community, local uh, entities outside of, you know, the, the, in some ways, the normal pathways of US aid and, and government engagement. And I, I wanted, um, so, Dr. Musa, you mentioned um, trying to reach out to sort of uh, atypical actors. And so I wanted to ask all of you if you had some thoughts on, on and this is building in part on, on Chair Manza's uh, original question, uh, do you have some thoughts on how to, how to reach um, those, those kinds of atypical actors who are you know, maybe outside of these traditional um, pathways? Um, and then, I, and then my, my, my other question, which is really just to add more challenges to the very <laughs> deeply complex um, uh, conversation that we're already having is how do we think about um, you know what what is happening in so many fragile areas and 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 states around the around the world, which is you know which is the migrations and and how do we think about um, you know what does it mean to engage uh, in 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 some of the the you know uh, James you spoke about uh, prevention like how do we do that in the context of of where we have populations that are local that are moving. Um, and, um, and and engage in that way. So I just wanted to 
to put both of those out there and, and realize I'm making it even more complicated than it already, it already is in some ways. I, I heard my name mentioned. Do you mind if I jump in on, on this? Um, I think there, there are a couple of, of principles when it comes to identity conflict that we have to consider. One is, um, and, and this is true, particularly in migration spaces where, where people move into areas of limited resources. Uh, what are people afraid of when they look at a different identity group? Um, there are usually two fundamental aspects here. One is practical and one is philosophical. And the practical is usually around a tension between an in and an out group over sort of a zero sum thinking about resources and power dynamics, right? So if you put a, a migrant group that has little resources into an urban periphery that has poor infrastructure, little resources and bad governance, then it's very easy for those two groups to, to develop a, a sense of identity tension across their, their differences. The other is, is philosophical or talking about religion, theological, which is this idea of, you know, uh, transcendent truths or identities becoming corrupted, quote unquote, by the other, by the other teaching and whatnot. So it's hard in, in a space that has a universality of truth uh, ascribed to it to then absorb a different truth with respect, tolerance, and even collaboration. But I think in those spaces, it's it maybe as simple as saying where identity is causing divides, particularly divine identity, religious identity, it's what is human that will unite, right? And so one of the great strategies, I think, in resolving identity conflicts is to find common needs that are practical and can be mutually advanced. When people work together, I know it sounds simple and intuitive, uh, but, but sometimes in practice it is not. But when people work together on things that they both need and they become dependent on one another to, uh, to, to move forward uh, and overcome challenges, then they naturally develop uh, respect, affinity, and, and cooperation in a way that starts to diminish those more abstract ideas of fear around the other. Uh, now, one of the things that I think is really important in these spaces of collaboration that we have to tackle, and it's in my written comments, but I didn't make, uh, make it in my spoken comments, is what I'm seeing more and more frequently, which I'm calling a religious schizophrenia. I think in religious communities, uh, there is one side of, of a religious community within the faith tradition that believes in caring for others, caring for all of what, what you know, the Abrahamic traditions might call creation, uh, which includes other identity groups and other people. And then there's one side that firmly believes that there's a divine uh, kind of compulsion to exclude and even punish those who do not have the same identity. And I think when it comes to working on freedom of religion issues and working on religious engagement issues, this is a very serious challenge that we have to start to reflect on. Uh, and these are within faith. We look a lot at the conflict between faith traditions. But what about the conflict in the same house of worship between the person who feels compelled to care for the other uh, as a manifestation of the divine and the one who feels compelled to persecute the other as a manifestation of the same divine? And oftentimes, I think we shy away from struggling with that challenge. But if uh, any community should be struggling with that challenge, uh, it is probably this community. Since I'm happy to my name was. Well. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> um, sorry about that. Uh, I'm happy to jump in as well on uh, Commissioner Bargava's first question about how to engage with local actors and what can be done. I think a really important key to that is the localization agenda um, at USAID in particular, but the aid localization agenda. So to allow um, donor agencies to engage more with local actors. Um, and support local actors. Um, so the USAID Forward Initiative, um, the New Partnerships Initiative at USA, the Local Works, I know Ambassador Power uh, has put a lot of emphasis on this at USAID currently, but the barriers to entry for small local organizations to partner with aid are just too substantial. And so we're partnering with these large actors that don't necessarily have any relationships in these countries and in these contexts. And so allowing our aid agencies to engage directly with these local actors, I think would be would make a huge difference, um, both for engagement with religious leaders and actors, as well as for development. I think Professor Graf uh, uh, 
put, uh, you know, hit the nail right there about how difficult it is, but it, it is the, uh, and how we need to uh, shift our, our approach to, to get to the small actors. I think there's a couple of things I'm gonna say. Uh, just one is that our concept of religion uh, to Commissioner Bargava's question. So some of us come to the idea of religion and religion is the private, and we have this kind of narrow idea of religion, but in other communities, religion is webbed into cultural and a range of practices. So you can hardly distinguish what is religious and what we would call cultural, but it is, inter it is intermeshed, it is part of a complex reality. So we have to be aware of that. Now, even in that complex understanding of religion, and where religion is pervasive or its effects are pervasive, we sometimes as policymakers expect religion to do too much we think that religion is a silver bullet for all of these things, whereas other things need to be addressed. So for instance, I mean, when we go in with our program, we provide every uh, participant with a $70 monthly stipend and so on, and a computer and a high-speed internet link, okay? Suddenly you relieve that individual's existential crisis. This person can now really, uh, you know, release him or herself for study, for education, for discussion, um, things that otherwise the state or other kinds of institutions ought to have done to provide the person with certain kind of comforts, to provide the person with certain kind of exposure. So what is the greatest exposure? We take students from India and Pakistan, we take them to Nepal where they meet for two weeks and they talk to each other and they discover that that boundary is a political boundary, not a human boundary. We take them to Doha where, we, where they talk to each other where they see another country, they've never had ex so exposure. Let them speak to Christian theologians, Jewish uh, 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 colleagues, Hindu uh, interlocutors and so on. And suddenly they realize, oh my gosh. So exposure is the other thing. And, but I also think that the question about, you know, what religion need to do is, 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 is obviously, uh, we sometimes expect religion to do too much where other things also need to be in place. But in fragile states, we are now very desperate that we want religion to make some breakthrough because everything else has failed and the religion is enduring. So we then need to go into when we deal with religious actors with questions of freedom of religion and so on, we, deal, we need to do, deal with the sensitive, sensitively, but also with a long term agenda, not fly in and helicoptering in and out. Lastly, I would say your question, uh, Commissioner Bargava, was on the question of, you know, how do we get to atypical actors? I think we underestimate the resources in on this continent. And, you know, we have, for instance, you know, diaspora communities of a variety of places. They have native knowledge of those places. They can take you there. A university professor who had never been to Syria or Myanmar and so on might be scared and hesitant to go into those places. And when you go into those places, you reach those places that are safe. We don't want to take people to unsafe places, but we need to take them to atypical places. And therefore there you need conduits. You need people who can take you to those uh, you know, individuals and places where you will have a different kind of conversation. So I think it can be done. Uh, we need to make available grants and those kind of things that don't ask for these kind of formalities. You know, uh, you know, how many, what is the reach of such and such organization? How many people do they have? Do they keep a, you know, a balance sheet and so on and so forth? That is gonna block us from getting to, to, to the people that we need to talk to. Uh, and in that, in that talking to process, I, my experience would be, even though I'm a graduate of the madrasas from India 40 years ago, um, I do realize that I've learned a lot more and with my team that we have, you know, the worlds in India and Pakistan have changed 40 years later, and there's a lot to learn. So even for someone who considers himself kind of a, a, a native to that literacy, there's a lot to learn. May I add just in one minute without taking long, uh, just, to, just to say that I fully agree with what all the three panelists said, I, I love it and I fully agree with it. Just to add one more component, for me, I think it has been a, a tangible thing that identity, or religious identity is simply one of the so many identities that each one of us holds within. If this 
part of the identity is threatened in a way, it will jump and it will take over. It will start to, to address uh, the others based on these cases that we put them and classify them in. So the more we, we respect identity without threatening it, and the more we focus on all the other common identities of people, the all common shared uh, values, this is, I think, the best way to deal with migrants and refugees and all other uh, pluralistic uh, challenges that, that some countries face. And thus, we, we speak about inclusive citizenship that fully respects the identities and even allows them to, to express themselves in the public sphere, not only in the private sphere, yet it bases itself strongly and strictly on equal citizenship and on common values that we all share as human beings. Great, thank you so much. I know that we have a question from Commissioner Davey and then also I know Commissioner Kleinbaum will, will go directly to you afterwards and then Commissioner Khan will go to you if you'd have a question after that to make sure that all the commissioners have an opportunity to speak. Um, but I'm, I am really enjoying this conversation. I wish we had a couple more hours, but I know fortunately we have a little bit more time. So I'm glad that we can continue to, for this discussion, but Commissioner Davey. Sure, thank you, uh, Chair Mainza. And I think my question is for Dr. Musa, but um, obviously, uh, I, we'd invite um, any of the other panelists to um, uh, address it as well, um, should they want to. I, I, I'm, I'm curious about how you bring to scale in fragile countries, the kind of leadership development uh, that you addressed in your remarks. Um, how do you take these small gatherings of leaders, I'm assuming they're small, where, you, where one is taught tolerance, um, understanding of another's tradition, um, such that they are then going out and uh, being leaders in communities themselves. So how do you, how do you bring that to scale? Uh, and what can an organization like USERF do to assist with that, um, particularly, again, in fragile countries? And then, and then in the interim, um, how do we continue to protect uh, the rights of uh, minority or um, uh, minority groups, so sort of the, the fundamental human rights of all individuals, whether it's women and non-religious people or member, members of the LGBT community, while we're developing uh, leadership that will lead to more tolerance in these fragile states? How does an organization like you serve help in these in these two areas. If that's a fair question or question, it's a very unfair question, Professor uh, of Commissioner Davy. Uh, 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 it's it's a difficult question, and and I'll, I'll try my best. And you know, right now we are thinking um, about this question that this experiment that we had in India and Pakistan. You're right with a small group, and we are so delighted by the success. But how do we scale it up? And I've got, I have two minds on this. One is that, so we do have local partners, credible local partners who do the work. So the experiment in, in Pakistan is, is in this way that the International Islamic University has now picked up our agenda and they're running and they've got government funding and they're doing the kind of work we have done. So in that way, our job is done in that when local actors pick it up and take it seriously. And they can scale it up in ways that outsiders cannot because there are all kinds of challenges for outside money, you know, John Templeton Foundation funded this, Notre Dame, Catholic University, what are they trying to talk about madrasas, right? That's all right. I have to put my face in there and say, no, it's me, right? And then, and then you both trust. So I think the way to scale that would be for USERF and other institutions you know, to contact, be in touch with those kinds of institutions that where we, this work has been seeded, but people are prepared to now scale it up in country and own it. That's the best way to form the partnerships, whether it's through funding or resource sharing and a whole variety of ways that, that could be done. The other thing is to continue the small scale conversation too. So it doesn't have to be the franchise of Notre Dame alone. It can be a range of actors uh, that do different kinds of work uh, in the way that our experiment showed to be, to be successful. And, and I think it, it can do so. In the interim, what do we do to protect the, the, human, the human rights of these various uh, sectors that you just mentioned? Um, you know, see, pressurizing governments is one thing and, 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 and talking to them is, 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 is one thing, but how can we talk to, in the interim, 
how can we make you know institutions of civil society become the voices and and especially in fragile states where obviously government does not necessarily listen to to civil societies but civil society is effective because that is the 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 face where people are interacting people are coming to 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 workplaces people are coming to uh, you know churches and 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 recreational places and so on where discrimination can take place and that's where the intervention is required so i do believe that the, the, there's possibilities there that working through institutions of civil society um, can be the place to do so but i think governments are are they just going to say yes especially in fragile states because they got other objectives therefore they are fragile uh, and and obviously they'll be waiting for they'll be waiting for for funding and you're not entirely sure that the funding will go to the right places um so so i think one has to be especially careful and obviously they're going to try and block you uh for getting the funding to the target groups that you want to you want to provide or communicate to those target groups so it requires a much more delicate uh, delicate balance but i think here this is where and i'm going to stop uh commissioner david this is where native knowledge this is where our resources in this country can be should be properly harnessed um our resources in the country is for not resources are phenomenal we and I, my saddest uh, realization is uh, being a US citizen for the past 20 odd years is that our government does not take our resources that we have uh, and, and, and utilize it effectively in a complex way. We cannot just listen to uh, four uh, experts. You might want to speak to 40 more experts to get a much more complex idea. Then you'll be able to see, okay, what is going to work. Thank you. I know, Corinne, you wanted to add to that? Yes, please, just very quickly, if I may, um, on Dr. Musa's point in response to Commissioner Davies' question about scaling, um, if we accept that uh, we need to engage more directly with local actors um, as a government through our agencies, um, an additional uh, uh, task that we can give our agencies is one of the functions they can have instead of uh, directly implementing programs is to identify those local partners um, and seed work at the local level. And then they can help connect those local partners with others in the international community, or even at the national level in, the, in their country in which they're working. So we have programs like that. Um, we've seen them in Sierra Leone and in other places, but focusing on that role of providing support to the local level and, and everything that we can do as an international actor to help with that, I think is really important. Thank you so much. Um, Commissioner Kleinbaum. Thank you so much, Chair Menza, and uh, thank you to the panelists. Really fascinating. And I agree with you, Chair Menza, this could really go on for many, many hours. Um, I know that in Holocaust studies, there's been a lot of discussion, um, particularly by Professor Tim Snyder at Yale, uh, as, the, as the world has opened up for Holocaust studies that it's less about ideology than about the complete destruction of civil society that makes the possibility of uh, violent actions moving from the ideology of discrimination to the actual, in some cases, genocide. And so I, I, hearing all of you speak in this framework is very powerful for me. And of course, we're talking about some very long-term complex state building kinds of things which are so uh, difficult to wrap our minds around. I'm wondering if you can offer any success stories or tell us are there of all of these fragile states and they're very different and they have many different complex issues. Do you see any in which there is some movement towards uh, improvement and where you serve or the United States has played a positive role that we can build on or imagine understanding using the phrase fragile state, of course, as all of you have pointed out, they're also very, very different with very different issues. Um, so that's one question. Like, do you see anywhere where that's happening, where st states that have been in such chaos or disarray uh, are able to, are the long-term issues are getting any better because we know that's ultimately going to be important. And the other is kind of the opposite end of that. When do we start advocating and thinking about uh, changing policies about uh, asylum, refugees, building on the ability to help more people get out. And 
I know that's not used to uh, our, our role here necessarily in terms of American policy about refugees, but uh, how do we do both of those at the same time? And do we see any examples of where, of things we can build on, of where we have seen some successes uh, and maybe not, but you're the expert, so I'd love to hear that. Yeah, I assume James wants to start. Go ahead, James. Thank you, Ellie. Yeah. Um, I, I don't know if there's a protocol to who, who should call on whom, but um, <laughs> yeah, thanks. Uh, thank you, um, Rabbi Kleinbaum. The, uh, the, the short answer to your question is yes. Of course, I think there, there are successes. Otherwise, many of us would probably have despaired by now. But um, And those are successes that we try to elevate and try to use uh, as models going forward. One of the things I think that's very important about conflict stability operations, and, and this is something I tell people coming into the field, is it's not a linear uh, kind of a work. You don't get from broken to unbroken. Um, if you're fortunate, you get from broken to less broken, but it's also a cyclical issue. It's a generational issue. There are a lot of pressures that are brought to bear to sustain identity conflict over generations and from community to community that, that just require a, a constancy of awareness and intervention. Um, and if I can really, really second and, and third and onward the, um, this discussion about local ownership, and this is where my success stories will come in. Um, we've been talking about local ownership for decades, though. This is not a new idea. We've been talking about the, the industry and the institutions getting closer to the ground. And yet what I see in the processes of, of proposal drafting, and we do lots of it, is that it gets harder and harder for a small local organization, even a small Washington, D.C.-based organization, in my case, uh, to keep up with some of the requirements for these proposals and to get through some of the the, the paywalls, if you want to call them that. And so what we do is we invariably tie ourselves into local communities and, and partners in ways that allow for uh, local ownership. And, and one of the key things, and I really want to emphasize this, is that what, what we need to have, and oftentimes I witness the failings on, is um, what I call methodological humility. Right. I mean, this idea that expertise is in the halls of power in Washington, D.C. Yes, we have certain expertise, but knowledge of the lived faith traditions, knowledge of the lived conflict, knowledge of what is in the way and what will help things get out of the way is all held within the communities. And so our expertise needs to be one of facilitation, where we bring in structures and frameworks that allow for that knowledge to then manifest in sustainable relationships and programs. And I'll give an example. I used to joke, you know, we're a conflict resolution organization that works with religious actors. And I used to always say, we don't build wells. It's really easy to count success if you build wells. It's hard for monitoring and evaluation when you're dealing with the transcendent and you're dealing with conflict. But ironically, we did build a well at one point. We were in a community in Yemen. And the local community members were lamenting over several different drivers of conflict, including recruitment by Al Qaeda and, and uh, ISY. And what they came to the conclusion on is when the government left it, it left in place one water system that was not serving surrounding communities, and there was some conflict around that. So we actually funded the implementation of a water project. But the water project drew on the youth who had already been recruited or were at risk of being recruited into the extremist organizations. And what that did, and I, you know, this is, we, we can explain this at greater depth at another time, but basically there was a whole web of dynamics that was happening, conditions that were leading to conflict that included questions of belonging, questions of economic opportunity, questions of lack of infrastructure, and this sense of disempowerment. But when the youth got involved in this project, and we're able to give back to the community. And I've seen the same thing with gangs in Latin America, et cetera. They've developed a sense of not only deep ownership of the program because they had determined what was necessary, but a sense of belonging and responsibility that then caused them to reject the idea that these extremist organizations that were coming in, not on ideological grounds, but on practical grounds, saying they could offer services, were no longer necessary, that they had a sense of empowerment themselves. Then we had built the relationships where they were able to go out and find funding themselves to extend this program to other communities around in the area. So there was a training of trainers type uh, element to it. There was a capacity building element to it. There was a networking building element. And honestly, when we backed out, you know, hopefully when you leave, 
They don't even notice because you've left so much behind that is theirs already. It's just empowered that you're no longer necessary. And so these are the kinds of things that I would just encourage. And there are myriad, myriad examples of successes at the local level that I think should inspire us all to, to be hopeful. Yeah. Yes, you can, Dr. Hindi, please add to that. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, just to, to maybe continue with the, with the concept of uh, how strong civil society can actually help uh, uh, build that. Uh, for us, the example in, in Lebanon and in Iraq, it has been this exactly. It has been uh, where people, uh, not necessarily uh, um, maybe people of faith, put it in that sense, have met in civil society for common objectives, for common uh, projects, for development projects, for uh, peace building negotiations and so on. These people would have done the process that maybe uh, uh, Dr. Musa explained, which is going across the fear and then meeting the other and then being changed by that other and by that meeting and by that daily interaction. So for us, in, in the two contexts that we have strongly been invested in Lebanon and Iraq, we have seen that people who have been in such an experience would be the best leaders of, of hope and would be the best leaders of, of, uh, of peace building in that sense, because themselves have been changed by the process. And thus, we always say that a Christian in Lebanon is completely different or to a large extent, very different than a Christian from uh, the United States or otherwise, even in the way he reads and he lives his faith. Same for a Muslim who is in a pluralistic society or, or otherwise. So for us, the, the stronger the civil society is and the, song, the stronger these common work that have been done over the years and years in the common space, which is the public space, the stronger it would be uh, or the more difficult it would be to create conflict and uh, to use religion for one against the other. Great, I know that Corinne, I think you had your hand up and then um, Dr. Musa, if I remember correctly. Yes, thank you. Um, I just. I just want to come back quickly to the question from Commissioner Kleinbaum, because I think it's very important not to leave the impression that there are no successes or that we don't know whether we can achieve success. Um, and I agree with everything my colleagues have said. Um, I think one example of a country where we've achieved success is Kenya um, through its elections. Uh, and we've worked very hard as a government to ensure peaceful elections in Kenya after what happened in the late 2000s. Um, and I think I, I don't want to I don't want us to take credit for that. We had to work with a lot of partners, but I do believe those are models that we should look at in terms of success. And I think one of the keys, as you're you're suggesting, Commissioner Klenbaum, is that Kenya has a really healthy civil society, and we're working with those actors, and we worked with those actors to prevent violence. And we're engaging with um, moderate Muslim organizations in Kenya, and they're key to to the success that that we've seen there. So I think that's really important. I think there are other places where we've seen success, um, Colombia, Indonesia, um, and others. But I do think it's really important not for us to, to think that or to suggest that there are no successes or that you know, we haven't been able to achieve that. Thank you so much. Dr. Musa? I want to agree with my colleagues and all the nuances and the success. So we, we, shouldn't, we shouldn't give up. And I think success also comes in kind of uh, small stories. Uh, and I'm just going to, uh, you know, uh, telegraph four things. In our program, one of the kind of successes was to start on time. Just starting on time. I mean, first day people came late and they saw, when they came in, you know, the classes already start. I mean, this has never happened before and they, in their own experiences. Secondly, faculty listen to what participants have to say and they feel free and they are not lectured to, but it's a conversation. That's the second success. And the third is in civil society, is how do we, so people discover very qualified, very knowledgeable, very talented individuals find their voice. These voices would never make it out in the public were it not for some kind of tuition, some kind of help, some kind of ability, enabling them, enabling them to get their voice. So sometimes the success is maybe not in, in, in large terms, and I think we have great successes too, as our colleagues have shared, but these small successes that transforms an individual and a group's life to be on time, to listen to one another, and to develop a voice. 
Thank you so much. And Commissioner Khan, I believe you have a question. And you, you're on mute. Can you? Great. Thank you. Um, I, I know there's a, a, a very little time left, but uh, as a student of uh, your scholarship, uh, Dr. Al-Hindi, uh, Professor Graf, uh, Dr. Payton, and Dr. Musa, thank you. I shall read your testimony uh, on daily basis to be heartened. Thank you. Uh, I asked the question, uh, uh, as American doctrine of foreign policy shifts towards relentless diplomacy, uh, do you, I know you have answered in your statements, I've been listening to it very carefully. Uh, do you uh, feel that institutions like you serve uh, reflect, and, 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 and I, I uh, want to reflect myself on our past approach to international religious freedom and in their reflection, uh, is there room for uh, a regard for faith and culture of the people with whom we engage or within the framework of USERF, we make sure that, uh, uh, that within our framework, the work that we do of recommendations uh, we reflect uh, a regard for faith and culture of the societies that we engage. Uh, I would like to, to hearten myself, I would like to hear your brief comments on it. Uh, uh, we can start with, uh, uh, with uh, Dr. Al-Hindi. Thank you so much, sir. I, I do think that um, to a large extent we cannot and we should not deal with politics and international relations outside the scope of ethics. For me, the more you are able, the more you have the responsibility to do so. Um, and thus it is by priority for me, um, an essential uh, moral duty of the US to actually promote these uh, values in every aspect of its foreign policy and every aspect of its aid and development policy in that sense. So I do think that, uh, um, um, at times we have we have been reluctant or the us have been reluctant yes at other times they have paid the price for for their interventions but i think the more we focus that intervention on promoting values and on working with the local actors the more we can avoid uh, missteps uh, and the more we can get better results in that sense professor grant Yes, thank you, Commissioner. I agree entirely with uh, Dr. Al-Hindi. I think the one concern I would have is that, um, as we've discussed over the past hour, is that what we're promoting are values and faith and not just our values, because there are different ways of interpreting them. And of course, not anything goes. I don't want to suggest that. There are universal values, of course. But where we have faltered in the past is going in and assuming that we know what a community's values are or what their, um, what their needs are, and, and that's led us into trouble. And so hopefully we will have that sensitivity going forward um, to acknowledge that we need to support the reformers in those countries. Stop there. Dr. Payton. Yeah, I think the only thing I would add is that you know, if we, if we can launch our engagement with others from a foundation of human development and human dignity, uh, where we think in terms of maybe, you know, as Amartya Sen uh, talks, you know, development is not just economics. It's really about being able to, to make choices uh, about your life and your future. Um, and those choices then will be things that people will dictate themselves. Uh, again, I think that Despite our best efforts uh, and our best intentions, oftentimes we come in with a very, very um, clear idea of what people need from us, what we bring to them, rather than what they can create or generate themselves if they are given um, the chance and the opportunity 
uh, and the assistance to do that. Uh, so that would just be my encouragement. Dr. Musa. Thank you. Um, uh, my colleagues have already covered most of what I was going to say, except that I would say that one of the things, add that we need to think about ways in which people to people conversations can happen. I think people to people diplomacy where uh, just makes breakthroughs that this issue, this image of the US government and America just dissipates because that has a certain kind of impression around the world. Uh, you know, America's impression in Europe is very different from what it is in Sub-Saharan Africa or in, uh, in South Asia. And I think the, uh, so that's the one thing. Um, what my colleagues have already said that let's not be too prescriptive uh, because prescription comes with suspicion. Advance the cultural and religious literacy in our own midst and in our own policy circles. The more we deepen that, the more complex we have that amongst ourselves, we'll understand the world better. No one can disagree with ethics as, as, as Professor Al-Hindi had talked about the need for ethics, but it's the application and the approach to the ethical that is gonna be so crucial. And so I think we come with great ethical values, but the way in which these ethical values are, are applied and through policy and others, and you know, the, we live in a, 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 a world that is now a, a global village. People know what we are doing in different places of the world. We, we can no longer hide. And, uh, and, and therefore, it's a very transparent world. And therefore, we need to have our best behavior in, in, at all times. Thank you. I think that was everyone. I want to make sure. Um, well, I want to say thank you to our really so impressive panelists. And of course, my colleagues for such insightful questions. I did want to mention that USERF creates a hearing summary that, from this event today. And, I think that's going to be an important document that hopefully we can um, pass along to government officials, especially those that work in, um, in, in fragile states, especially the young up and coming diplomats to, to, to have this kind of wisdom and to be able to know who you are, be able to go back and read some further um, testimonies that we'll also post on our website. Um, because I do believe that the information you have shared, and, and I know it was just a tiny bit of your expertise, is really what we, it, policymakers in Washington, that connection between what's happening on the ground and the local and that wisdom that you're all sharing, those nuances has is, is been really impressive just to see that thread between all four of you. And we really, again, appreciate your time. And we're so pleased um, that the USERF team, um, our professional staff has done just such a great job putting this together, of course. And I know that hearing summary will be a wonderful tool for us to further share the, the important information you have all presented this morning. So thank you again for joining us. And of course, to our participants, we appreciate you joining us and please look for our summary. It'll be forthcoming. Thanks so much. Thank you. Thank you.